So this would be mainly focused on uh, mathematicians today. So please uh, stop me uh, if anything is unclear, especially mathematicians. Okay. Uh, so we saw that non-invertible symmetries arise in many interesting quantum field theories. Uh, and so it would be good to have a mathematical structure which would describe such symmetries. For invertible case, it was not a big deal because it was essentially a group. And then there was an extra co-dimension that you had to worry about. And sometimes there could be mixtures, there could be some higher groups, but they're also very simple mathematical objects. But for these non-invertible symmetries, there are layers of structures uh, and it's convenient to encapsulate the whole structure about the symmetry in terms of a higher category. So let me first describe what is the relationship between higher category and the symmetry that we have been talking about. So say we are working in some d-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, and then uh, we said that symmetries of this quantum field theory are described by topological defects. So what would we would like to understand is what the most general mathematical structure that topological defects can form. So let's start thinking about it. So as we already discussed, we can have topological defects of various co-dimension, right? So we can have uh, defects of co-dimension one, two, up to D minus, up to D, up to point like things. But that's not the whole story. There's more, more than that. So if I have one of this co-dimension one defects, then I can have defects which do not live in the bulk, but which live along the surface of this. So I can have various kinds of defects, Line, so here will be co-dimension one inside this co-dimension one surface and co-dimension two, etc. So there's for each of these defects, there is a further set of defects that you can consider. And then you can go even further. So inside one of these defects, which is embedded inside another defect, you can ask what is the full spectrum of things that can live inside that sub defect. So that seems to be quite a lot of structure formally that you can have. Actually, uh, in terms of functional integrals, who would you do this? So there are some fields in the bulk and uh, any defect in that bulk will have some particular boundary conditions for the fields. Right. Suppose you have a defect inside a defect. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so, you, that so yeah, you, you can think of these defects as you have some other quantum field theory of lower dimension uh, that you have coupled. So some topological quantum field theory that you have coupled to the bulk and then this theory can itself have uh, its own symmetries. So and then the condition will have a boundary condition now inside the yes that kind of thing. Okay. is there some consistency condition which you require to be able to define such things uh, yeah they will be encapsulated by this uh, category so there will be some coherence relations in these categories that need to be satisfied so that basically means doing two different kinds of topological manipulations which uh, take some correlation function to the same correlation function uh, and so you can do some topological manipulations which change your partition, your correlation function by some phases. But if in the end you reach the same one, then the two phases need to be the same. Uh, yeah. okay. But will this lead to a unique boundary condition on the fields on the defect? Leap boundary condition? Unique is the bound. So you'll get some boundary condition. You are saying that's a consistency condition. Yeah. But is it unique? What boundary condition you actually put on the fields, uh, for example? So to, to define the defect, you mean? To define the path integral over the fields on the defect, right? You have to put some yeah. boundary condition. Yes. So that that's uh, some boundary condition is going to define a defect. And then the question was, if I have some of these boundary conditions, I can, I can have a manipulations that take me from one set of boundary conditions to another set. And then I was saying that if you have two different manipulations, uh, that take you between the same source and target boundary conditions, then they must match the, the changes in correlation functions coming from them. 
I also actually had another thing about that. I mean, are there obstructions to defining certain uh, kinds of defects inside? Sure. Yeah. That was. There will be all sorts of cohomological obstructions, etc. Yeah. Okay, but suppose you don't have obstruction, right? Yeah. I mean, is it a unique choice of boundary condition that you can make? Or are there, I mean, given the symmetry, given the algebraic structure that the symmetry satisfies, yeah. is the choice of boundary condition unique? So here when I was saying boundary condition, I meant that it defines a topological defect. So it's defining the elements of the algebraic structure. I see. So it's not just, I mean, I thought the elements of the algebra you can write in terms of the abstract symmetry principle, right? As you saw. Yes. Some composition law. Right. right? Given those composition laws, mm -hmm. is there a unique choice of boundary condition that describes the dynamics of the modes on the defect? Uh, right. So the construction goes this way. So you can have all sorts of these defects, and some of these defects can be realized by coupling a lower dimensional TQFT. So you 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 have a theory. And you take some lower dimensional TQFT and somehow couple it to this bulk QFT. And that gives you a topological defect. So this gives you a topological defect. Uh, but not all of them may be realized this way. Uh, and the question may be, I think you're asking whether this is this map is injective. Right? So I think the, that's true. So we will explicitly study these kind of couplings today. And we will see in those cases at least it's injected. Yeah. Can you say again which map is injected? Yeah, from TQFTs and their couplings. So there's two pieces of information, and then you go to into topological defects in that theory. I thought the definition of a defect was a TQFT on this thing which is coupled to. No, a defect can be something defined. It's part of the data of a theory. It's some. It may not arise by some coupling of a TQFT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could be satisfied by boundary conditions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but more abstractly, boundary conditions might not. So you're choosing some set of fields when you talk about boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions for those fields, even though even if they're fundamental fields of the theory they might not give all sorts of defects. So we know examples of non-topological defects like this, uh, maybe like Thuf defects, for example, uh, no, they are boundary conditions. But for example, Wilson defects, they would be boundary conditions of magnetic fields, but Thuf defects are boundary conditions of the electric fields, yeah. Is it right to say that a boundary condition is a defect, is a defect between theory and an empty theory or trivial theory? Uh, no, so this is a different kind of boundary condition. The boundary condition you are talking about is a, is a, is a, is a, is a co-dimension one defect between yeah. theory and the empty theory. Co-dimension one defect. Yeah. yeah. So here the boundary condition that we were talking about where you have chosen some fields and then you try to give them some fixed some values. values at some yeah. low side. But isn't there some, I mean, the two notions are supposed to be related, no? Right. So you can give uh, fixed values on co-dimension one low side. Yeah. And that can give you some special uh, boundary conditions inside the full set of boundary conditions of the theory. So the ones that come from specifying values of fields in the boundary, those are special examples of the, the more general thing? Yeah. So the yeah. most general definition of boundary condition is a defect right? between co-dimension one defect. just a co-dimension one defect which should satisfy the some, theory to some other conditions. Yeah. Right. So we have this whole complicated structure, uh, and it, this can be encapsulated in a higher category in the in terms of a higher category. So formally, what's going on is that first of all, I should describe what a higher category is for the physicists. Uh, so let's start with a category. What is a category? So in a category, you have uh, two sets of things. You have some sets of objects. Uh, and some sets of morphisms, which are arrows between these objects. So between any source and target object, you have some arrows, which would be the set of morphisms between these two objects. And similarly over here, and then there are composition rules. 
So if you pick a morphism and another morphism such that the target of one morphism is the source of the other, you can compose these to obtain a morphism between the first source and the second target. Uh, so this is just a bare bones category structure. And then on top of this, you can have other requirements. So the category for can be fusion, for example, which means that you have a tensor product uh, structure on these uh, objects and morphisms. So if you take two objects, you get another one by taking tensor product. Uh, if you have two morphisms, you can get another one, uh, such that the source and targets are also tensor products. Okay. Now, uh, a higher category So, for example, if I go to a two category, then this has more information. So, it contains morphisms between morphisms, or we would call them two morphisms between morphisms. So, you'll have some double arrows between these arrows. So, you'll have some set of uh, two morphisms between a source and a target morphism. And similarly, you will have for the other guys. And then again, there is a composition. So once you have chosen these two, you will have a composition arrow. And then as you increase uh, this number for an N category, you will have up to N morphisms. So you will have uh, three morphisms go between two morphisms and so on inductively. Okay. So what have we got to do with topological defects? Uh, and the, the identification is as follows. Uh, first of all, so in general, the symmetries of a d-dimensional quantum field theory, any general symmetries, uh, can be described in terms of a d minus one category. So you have objects, one morphisms up to d minus one morphisms, uh, and the objects of this category. Uh, are identified with topological defects of co-dimension one. These are the objects. Then morphisms, one morphisms are topological defects of co-dimension two. And the source and target is the it specifies this co-dimension two defect uh, interpolates between which two co-dimension one defects. So the picture is like this. So you have some objects O1 and O2 in your category, which describe topological defects. And then there is a spectrum of co-dimension two sub-defects of this co-dimension one defect, right? Uh, so, right. so let, let me call use a better notation. So let me label them by the dimension. So the D, D minus one, the first one and the second one. And then you can have some defects of D minus two, which interpolate from one to two. And the, all the possible spectra of such co-dimension two defects. Uh, are one morphisms between the same two set of same two fixed objects corresponding to these two co dimension one defects. Okay. Now, what is the composition for one morphisms? It's simply you just extend this picture and say you have chosen so now you have two one morphisms. These are topological, there is a nice OPE between them. Uh, so you can take an OP by without leaving the co-dimension one defect surface. So this you can replace by the composed thing. So DD minus one. The surface, uh, the defect label by two has completely disappeared in, the, in this process. Okay. 
Now you have uh, two morphisms. Yeah, and the subscript is the dimension of it in full space time when the upper so superscripts are labels. Uh, so this uh, d minus two dimensional defect is supposed to be in the at the intersection of these two uh, yes. dimension one d minus one defect. So that's an actual space time picture that you're drawing there. Yes. Okay. What if I consider, for example, two different space time slices? I mean, this picture will not work there probably. Uh, what, what two what uh, spatial slices like on, yes. on the time direction. So they don't seem to intersect anywhere. Yes. Except probably at infinity. Right. So there is no composition there. So there will be a fusion structure which I will describe later. That's later. But so you're saying all these one morphisms are trivial in that case. When you have these uh, co dimension one defects which don't intersect. Uh, this does not rely on space time, right? This is just a picture or living on a defect. So it's, it's just about the spectra of defects in that theory. And then you can. So this property is independent of where you place them. Right? Right. Suppose I just have a zero form symmetry in a theory. Yeah. Some completely vanilla theory. Yeah. So then uh, all my defects will probably be just spatial, living on spatial slices yes. on the time direction. Mm -hmm. And um, what you're saying is, so suppose I take two different spatial sizes at different time instants. Mm -hmm. Those two don't intersect. So there's no yes. co-dimension two defect yeah. interpolating between yeah. them. So there is no one morphism between those two objects. That's the is that the conclusion? No, uh, it's just you have placed them at different location, but you could have not placed them like that, right? It's a, so if I just put them on top of each other, is that also no? That's probably the fusion which I will talk about later. It's just uh, so you choose a co-dimension one manifold and another co-dimension one manifold says that they intersect along a co-dimension two. Once you have chosen, you pick. It's like if I have a plane and I'm using a one dimensional defect to yes. oh. Yeah, they, they join, they come yeah. join together. Yes. So it's yes, so they come and join. Yeah. Yeah, that's also very good. So what do you call an intersection? Uh, no, I, I'm talking about joining. So yeah, that's the right terminology. Yeah, the, yes, and, and those ones are uh, isomorphic to these, but there might be non-trivial isomorphism. So that, that's some additional information that this this category is not capturing. So you can, if you have something like this, what you can do is you can squeeze locally a little bit over here, and you can replace this picture by something like this. Now a trivalent one you can understand, right? So. Right. Oh, yeah, even this you can describe categorically. So you, you take the tensor product, you fuse them completely. Right, so something like this. It, it will be part of the tensor product that I would describe. So if you have something like this and you have some uh, defect living over here, this can be replaced by something living between A tensor B and C tensor D. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, just, just to be completely clear, when you say objects. You mean topological defects of codimension one can put them wherever in space time, right? Yeah. All possible choices of locations of these codimension one defects comprises the set of objects. Yeah, you, you have objects if before putting them, and then you can put them somewhere. So you have objects are actually important. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different types, and the, the same type can be put on two different co dimension and manifolds. Call them two different objects. I call them the same, the same object. Okay. okay. I see. That's, that's yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Right. So, for example, maybe you're going to say it, but uh, yesterday you had this U G, mm -hmm. sigma, some M B, M D minus one. Yeah. So G is what tells you which object. Yes. Where you put it, that M D minus one information is irrelevant. It's not part of the category. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, so uh, suppose you have a core dimension two defect without any core dimension one defect. Uh, does that mean that that will be counted as a morphism between identity uh, between the identity uh, element or something like that? Okay, thank you. So there is also notion of identity object, which just uh, denotes uh, the trivial co-dimension one defect. And then if you have a co-dimension two defect, like for one form symmetry, uh, then that is a morphism from the identity object to the identity object. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. So uh, now let's discuss two morphisms. So again, the logic is similar that topological defects of co-dimension three. Uh, and now, so in, if you go back to this picture over here, there's something like this. So you can have two of these, uh, let's say from So you can have two different ways of changing DD minus one, uh, one to two, uh, labeled by another one and two, and then you can have a co-dimension. Sorry, this is two. And you can have a co-dimension three defect, which goes between these two. Right. So that would be a two morphism between these two one morphisms that the and the one morphisms themselves go between the same objects. And again, their composition is similar. You can take two of these and then you can fuse them. You can take an OPE of them uh, and bring them together. Uh, and then you can uh, visualize the picture. So on. it continues iteratively like this. Okay. Now there is an important structure on top of this, which is the structure of fusion. We already discussed it a little bit. So there is a tensor product on this whole category, uh, on this higher category, uh, and, and that corresponds to taking fusion in another by, by sep after separating them a little bit. So you can have a picture like this. You take two of these d minus one defects, separated in time a little bit, and then you bring them together, take an OPO from the other direction. And then you can replace this by a single four dimension one defect, which, is, which can be denoted as the tensor product or the fused co-dimension one defect. I mean, in a way, this is not different from the code, uh, what you described earlier, right? So the fusing defects. Yeah, it's again an operation of fusion, but on right. the level of higher category, this is now a monoidal structure. Yeah, so but uh, the only difference is here, the defects are from a theory to itself, right? Yes. That's why you have, you yeah. call it a tensor. Right. But if you allowed to change the theories theories then, in between yeah, the defects. you will obtain a D category in which is a composition of morphisms. So monoidal category is like a special case of a Of a one, uh, yeah. Where you put only one theory in the bulk or whatever you want to call it, right. highest dimension. So, in the case of the uh, ordinary currents, this would be just the OPE of the currents. Yeah, uh, if if they are integrated versions, then you can just take the OPE of the currents and then integrate the OPE. Uh, I don't know if it's not sure uh, because that that OPE will also have some singular terms, right? Yeah, but the integrated version, which is the topological, well, uh, yeah, the, the charges have a, a algebra, yeah. Lie algebra in that case. Uh, so. yeah. yeah, and uh, the Lie algebra, then when you exponentiate the Lie algebra structure, that becomes the group structure. The group structure. So that's the special case. Yeah. Right. So this gives you a tensor product on the objects of the category. 
Uh, tensor product on one morphisms is also similar. Actually, we can describe it here. So let's introduce some DD minus two. So suppose you have a configuration like this, you have two defects, uh, which are, and you're interpolating between two co-dimension one defects using a co-dimension two defect, and the same picture over here with some other labels. And then you bring these two together again. So when you bring them together, on the top, you will have one of the objects. At the bottom, you have the other one, and then in the in between, you will have what whatever uh, co-dimension two defect that you obtain, which interpolates now between these two co-dimension one defects, which is uh, by definition the tensor product. Uh, and so on. So you can also now have two morphisms, and then you bring them together. You obtain a tensor product on T two morphisms. Okay. Uh, there should also be some. Okay. Right. Uh, so you have a higher category which has a monoidal structure, which has this tensor product structure on top of it, at least. And then, depending on various dimension, you can have various kinds of braiding properties between these defects as well. So if you link them with the other. And then you unwrap the linking, then it can produce various kinds of factors. Okay. But this monoidal structure you're describing will not have any kind of symmetry property, right? It's, it's on, a, on a line. Yes. Choose in one direction. You can't move them past each other. Right. So it, it will give you fusion categories, but if you want to do oriented things, you want to have some spherical structure on top of it. I think this tensor product, at least the way you defined it, yeah. I don't see how you can move things past each other because they're on one line. You need to yeah. in one direction. Yes. You can't braid it. But you can consider braiding, right? So you can, you can consider other configurations. If you have four dimension two defect with a line, you can now wrap it and. What do you mean? The other structure which I'm uh, suppressing also. My question is just about this tensor product. This one is not, it doesn't have any kind of braiding group. The one you had written on the board? Yeah, it, it's, it's forgetting the braidings. It's a, but they, they, can, they can be braiding now. You can move, so say they, they, there were no co-dimension one defects, you could try to move it past over here. You can do some physical operations which convert this tensor product and give it a braided structure. I don't see that. Okay. I, mean, I can see, like, for example, if this is a three dimensional picture, I can see yeah. all the orbitals going around each other. Right. But I don't see how you can braid uh, so, two of these things DD minus one and DD D minus one, one and DD minus one. So uh, take the three dimensional picture and uh, suppose you have some lines. Uh, right. So what, what do you say? So you can consider pictures like this, right? You can. Uh, yeah. Right. So. You have two of them, so at least you, you can, so these are now morphisms of the identity, two identity endomorphism, both of them. You can now take a tensor product this way, or you can take the tensor product the other way, but they're bound to be the same because you can uh, move it around the other. But this I agree, I mean the line operators have this period. Uh, but now if you have an X, suppose this comes attached to a surface, this braiding won't be allowed anymore in a, but there will be some extra, it will be some sort of twisted braiding. Mm -hmm. You can try to take this line operator, pull it through this surface. It might have some simple phase factors coming or it might be some more, something more complicated that can happen. I don't think so. Okay. Okay. The surface comes with some co-dimension one defects, right? On the... Yeah. How do you move them past each other? So that's part of the data, right? So you can consider the most general thing that might be something complicated. Yeah, I'm saying for the most, like, I mean, of course, if you consider some trivial theory or something, you, you move everything past everything. Yeah. 
but uh, for like a general theory yes there will be some structure and just a moment try to figure out what the axioms of that are there is be some sort of i'm trying to figure out if there's any commutative commutative any kind of grading at all i think they won't be right right uh i could mention one not could mention two and so on yeah uh, you can certainly move this line past the surface so let's say if you try to do that you obtain a something like this that you obtain another surface coming out and the line attached to it this is just i pulled the line through it and then there will be line over here as well and now you have you had another line on the surface which will, which is this line and you can you wanted to fuse this with that so you can try to go fuse that and then creates an extra bubble of a surface and so this is some structure that fusing it from this direction uh, and then you can fuse it from the other direction and now you can look at what sort of consistency conditions this is still a co dimension 2 and higher not co dimension 1 this line operator is co dimension 2 yes I, even you can have surface and you can play similar game. i'm just saying that there is something complicated that i'm suppressing there's some something that you can do by topological moves yeah maybe we can discuss yeah okay uh, it's a defined theory or no i mean if i think so uh, so you'll have Two different surfaces with some other theory. Ball in the ball, is that right? Yeah. So you might not be allowed to pass a surface through a co-dimension one surface through co-dimension one surface. So you can just fuse them, and uh, and then there is a fusion in the opposite direction, and then those two don't match. They have two different defects. Yeah. but in some cases it does happen that when you pass there is a notion of passing through and then in between you obtain a gauged theory okay yeah. this is the set probably relates to your point yeah okay um okay uh right so uh, we have already seen an example of this kind of structure so yesterday we discussed Uh, we discussed the case of having a g zero form symmetry so let me write gamma zero and when this group is non abelian and finite so say this is acting on some theory then in the gauged theory we saw that there is a symmetry given by the rep representations of gamma zero and these were wilson lines and this 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 rep gamma zero is actually a one category uh this is a category of representations in in this the objects are representations and the morphisms between two representations are intertwiners between those representations uh so physically this uh, these are wilson lines each representation gives you a wilson line so you have r1 and r2 and intertwiners are to topological local operators that join these lines and they're topological they can be moved around so the whole system can be moved around anywhere you want okay uh uh we also discussed other kinds of non invertible symmetries like uh, coming from spin 4m theory so we we had spin 4m uh pure gauge theory in four dimensions and then there was an outer automorphism symmetry which was acting on the one form symmetry so there was a z2 times z2 one form symmetry and then there was a zero form symmetry uh, outer automorphism which acted on by interchanging these two and then when we gauged this one from this zero form symmetry we went to in plus four and theory 
may be expected to obtain a direct sum of this spinner and cospinner, which could be non invertible. So we had something like a U. Uh, let's use our new notation. We had a D to S and a D to C. And we expected some sort of a direct sum of these two guys to become an individual object. So it's a, it becomes an irreducible object after gauging. Let's call it SC. And we want we wanted to figure out the fusion rules for this. For example, it was clear that it would be non-invertible, uh, and the naive answer would be something like this: it would be just the identity one, two times the identity plus two times uh, the one the one which survives the diagonal one, which we are calling the vector one, which is invertible. So we still have. So this would be the naive one. And we will see today that it's actually not correct. There are actually some uh, some subtleties that arise, and you obtain something called as condensation defects over here. And we will see that this whole category, this whole category here, which contains surfaces uh, and lower dimensional things, now it will be a two category because your surfaces, lines, and points, which are objects, one morphisms, and two morphisms. This two categories is, is again a category of these. This type, a representation category, which is what is known as two representations. It's a higher dimensional analog of representations. Uh, so it it will be a two representation of uh, what is known as two group rather than a group. So you can ask a question. Um, can you just walk us through. Like I didn't quite understand Sorry? how you got this. I mean, you said this isn't the right answer, but how do you even get to the wrong answer? How do you deduce it's a wrong answer? No, how do you even get to this? Uh, ah, because uh, just square this. So you had the S squared was identity, C squared was identity, and then two times the the product of this was B. No, no, my question is more basic. Like suppose I start with this 4D spin, what's it spin for in pure gauge theory? How do I find out that yeah, what is the statement I didn't understand? Uh -huh. The one form symmetries. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So let me uh, provide more details also about this. Right. So we started with a four-dimensional spin four n theory, which was pure. Uh, the center of this would be the one form symmetry, uh, and the center is z two times z two, which can be labeled by spinner and cospinner representations. And then there is an outer automorphism of spin 4n, which is a zero form symmetry. Now it exchanges these two representations. So it exchanges these two z2 factors. Now we gauge this outer automorphism, zero form symmetry. This z2 gets added to the gauge group, but it acts on spin 4n. So it actually becomes a semi direct z2, which is spin plus 4n. So now we have a 4d pin plus 4n gauge theory. What happens to one form symmetry is that. Uh, the diagonal of this was not being acted upon by the zero form symmetry. So the diagonal Z2 survives because gauge invariant. This is this D2V object. Okay. Uh, and the S and C are not gauge invariant, but the direct sum is because uh, I've taken a sum. So it interchanges it. So there is some irreducible D2SC combined out of S and C. And then the question is what is the category formed by this D2V and D2SC? It, these are some surfaces, so it should be some two category. What is the precise two category, including all the morphisms, etc.? I see. And is the statement that these are just some of the? I mean, there's some construction of defects that you're using, yeah. which gives these guys. Yeah. Do we know that these are all? Uh, I mean, so these, these, there might be others, but these are the right. ones which are descending from spin four n. So it's some sub sub two category of the full three category of symmetries. But even in the spin four n thing, how do we know what are all the defects? Oh, we don't. Uh, so no, okay. this, this is not a, this is not a statement it's about not an all. Okay. About some. Like, here are some of them, and this yes. is a subcategory of the defect. Uh, no, I don't know. Yeah. Right. So I, this would turn out to be actually a two category known as the two representations. Of a two group. Uh, 
in spin four n, uh, there might be more. So, I, yeah, I don't have a proof for it. So, so for it, yeah, I can give some examples of. A, Yes. There's just a definition of symmetries, and this is now some subsymmetries that we are looking at. Yes. We define symmetries as topological defects. So now the question is: Are there more topological defects than these? Right. No, uh, no. This is the most general definition that we are working with. It includes. Yeah. So happen that they are associated. Right. So you're saying that that's not an exhaustive way of finding. Right. So in some sense, they will all be associated to spin four n because that's all the information I'm putting in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you an example of more uh, defects, right? So let me give you more uh, dimension. No, the, the classifying stress was for some symmetry that you know about in your theory. So the question is how to find the full set of symmetries. It's like asking what's the full spectrum of operators of this theory, which are topological with an extra restriction of topological. Right. It's a hard question. The operators that we have not yet. Uh, so we choose a closed subset under. So yeah. Uh, yeah. How do we know it's closed? closed yeah. Well, uh, those some things you know, right? Uh, you know that there is a one form symmetry, so it's a close, it's a group. It's a Z2 times Z2 group, and that's it. Then you know there is a zero form symmetry, and it acts on this in a certain way. That's. But this could no, But this. It was, uh, yeah, under OP, yes. But this gamma zero could act on some other gamma two, for example, which is also associated to spin four right. in some way. So that would give you new symmetries, but at least this was a closed subcategory that I've chosen. It, so as long as it's a consistent category that you've chosen already, then you can proceed and see what happens to this. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I want to work with this theory. Yeah. Yes, they could. Right. Right. Okay. Isn't this a dynamical question of you know when you fuse two defects, mm -hmm. what are the things that you get? To, that's a Dutch. I mean, I'm I'm not, I'm not seeing. I think why how you can say that it is closed. If it, it, normally in a symmetry algebra, you say it's closed because of the fact that the Lie algebra is closed. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, or, or in a CFT, you can talk about, you know, the primaries of a CFT, you can. So here for one form symmetry, we had uh, an action of this uh, explicit action fields, right? So they were uh, changing the gauge fields by some, uh, some an arbitrary one form. Uh, well, for abelian theory, not for this. Yeah. I, I mean, this algebra that you wrote uh, about this, uh, D two V square is identity, uh, for instance. That's that's just following from the fact that uh, this is this is Z two inside the Z two times Z two one form symmetry. 
Right, but uh, supposing the one form symmetry was extended with other things that there were some mm -hmm. other one form symmetries that yes. uh -huh. then how do I know that that it's some direct product of them or something? I mean, uh, if this was closed, then you knew that d two v squared was one before gauging. Correct, but if we don't know that, I, I, that's what I think the question was. Uh, how how do we know it is closed? In this particular theory? Yeah, because if you don't know that there can, I mean, if there might be more one form symmetries, yeah. you said that's a possibility, right? Yeah. That there could be more one form symmetries. Right. Huh, that is what, but how that's a dynamical statement. Uh, normally in a CFT, you see that by it, it's. But the scheme of that, the sure. Yeah. 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 But how, 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 what is the criterion is what I'm not seeing. In that case, there was some Z2 selection rule or something yeah. like that, uh, the Ising model. Uh, but uh, here is, you're saying that whatever must be there must be a direct, I mean, it must come as some direct sum of. So a group is closed, right? And if you said you had a one form symmetry group, you had a closed symmetry to begin with. Right. Now you, you might ask why was the group closed and the question becomes why is the center closed because center is a group. Okay, no, that is fine. I am willing to, uh, I see. so you're saying in this case, because it's an invertible yeah. uh, thing, you don't, uh, yeah. you don't have anything else. It must, so whatever is their uh, structure, the, this, this group uh, action will be there as part of that. Yeah. Okay. No, but I, I still don't understand actually about the same question. So, if I fuse two things with G labeled by G1 and G2, you're saying you're going to put G1, G2 on the resulting thing. So, okay, can you we fuse yeah. a manifold with label G1 mm -hmm. with label G2, get manifold with label G1, G1 G2. G2. Yeah. That you've declared by as an answer. So, I mean, like you've defined it like that, but it should come out of the, the theory, you know, like by yeah. studying the dynamics. Yeah. Of the, so it came out essentially from the fact that center was a group. You identify some symmetries labeled by elements of center, and the fusion is obey is the group multiplication of the center. So at some point, is a calculation of OP in this 4D whatever theory? Yeah, in some sense, yeah. It says that it agrees with this definition. Yeah. yeah. I, I think if I understood, he's trying to say that if you know that there is a group structure that is obeyed. Then the uh, by the symmetries, then the corresponding defects must obey the group structure of that. Uh, the OPE must the fusion must respect that group structure. So is that uh, is that? Yeah, uh, it's essentially it's a group. Yeah. yeah. So because you know that the center, this one form symmetry is associated with the center. And whatever other one form symmetries there might be, there is this piece which is a group, and uh, the elements of uh, the defects associated with these elements must obey the same group prop, uh, group law. I guess the, the the group is a just an additional structure that is there in the um, in the symmetries. Uh, uh, but when it is there, I, I mean, I thought it's an it's isomorphic. The Oh, you can find out how to Yeah, yeah. From that, I see Yeah. Right. Right. So I was saying that this we will recognize this category after gauging to be the two wrap of a two group. Uh, 
And this would have much more information than just this fusion rules. It will also provide us information about what are the possible ends and uh, transitions between these defects of that type. What are the full set of morphisms and everything? And it will correct this fusion rule as well. Okay. So before I go over there, I will first describe what is two rep of a group in a in a physical language. Uh, so, yesterday we talked about dual symmetry. So, if you gauge a symmetry over here as well, so when we gauge this zero form symmetry, we obtain the dual symmetry given by the representations because these were the Wilson lines. And the question is, is this all the dual symmetries that one gets? Uh, and it's actually not true. So, in general, you get lots and lots of dual symmetries. It's, uh, it's quite intractable, uh, but at least so you get some d minus one category of dual symmetries, and inside this there is a subcategory which can be thought of as the d minus one representations of this group inside the full dual symmetries. Uh, okay. Uh, so this representation piece sits inside these d minus one representations, and the way it sits is that you choose uh, this is a d minus one category. So you choose to look at some particular uh, d minus two morphisms inside this. So you look at d minus two and d minus one morphisms, such so that all the higher objects and morphisms are chosen to be identical. So we physically you are just basically ignoring all the things, all the other higher dimensional things, and you're looking only at the lines, genuine lines, which are not attached to any other surfaces or higher surfaces. And they, they form, if you look at this, those things inside this, that's precisely the representation. So now if you include surfaces, you will have two representations as well. And in fact, in this full dual symmetry category, if you look at the surfaces and the lower dimensional things, it's precisely two rep. So you're not missing anything. So if you just look at the lines inside the full dual symmetries, you will have the rep. And if you include surfaces, you have two rep. Uh, but as you go to three dimensional things, there is a difference between the correct three category over here uh, and the three rep over here. So here you have two rep is okay. Uh, okay. So what are these things? What what is two rep? So I want to not go into the mathematical definition of two representations, but you rather use a physical uh, picture for it. And so to go there, we need to first ask. Why did we even obtain the representations? Is there a more physical intuitive way to understand why we obtain representations? We said these are Wilson lines, uh, but there is a reformulation of this statement. Why do we obtain these Wilson lines? Okay, so the idea is as follows. Let me describe the general idea first, and then we will see that it reproduces the rep answer when we reduce to lines, restrict to lines. So here we have a d, our d-dimensional theory T and say it has this zero form symmetry gamma zero, which is non-anomalous. I'm assuming it's non-anomalous and it does not participate in higher groups. So I can gauge it. Okay. Uh, now uh, you can also separately consider this was d-dimensional. Now consider uh, another theory, which is p-dimensional for p less than d. Uh, let this be a TQFT now. So let this be a p-dimensional TQFT, which has also a gamma zero symmetry, which is non-anomalous and does not participate in any higher groups. Okay. So now we can just stack this p-dimensional TQFT on top of our theory. So 
let me call this TQFT as a DP. So you can, you have a stacking. These are two completely decoupled systems. You have a p-dimensional theory and a d-dimensional theory, which are not talking to each other at all. You have a gamma zero acting on this whole space, whole d-dimensional space, and the gamma zero acting on this p-dimensional space. Okay, but now when you gauge this gamma zero, what you can do is you can try decide to gauge a diagonal of these two gamma zero symmetries. So when you're gauging, you gauge over the whole thing. It's totally decoupled. So you just, uh, they're just stacked on top of each other and uh, there is no coupling between the two systems. Okay. So there's no energy transfer between them, for example. Okay. Or, uh, the hmm? the uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And gamma zero acts on both means that uh, gamma zero is some co dimension one operators, right? Topological operators, yeah, in this d dimensional space. I can just think of it as intersecting uh, dp in a co dimension one sub manifold, right? So you have some co dimension one surfaces here and co dimension one surfaces in this. And then you can say, I look at a diagonal, which means that you look, you, you combine these two co dimension one surfaces. So when this co dimension one surface intersects, this you identify the intersection point as the co dimension one surface of that. Okay. Uh, right. So when you now gauge it, because you have chosen a diagonal, this makes this couples this p dimensional system onto this d dimensional system. And they're now glued each other. You cannot separate them because of the diagonal gauging. So what you obtain now is a d dimensional theory, uh, T mod gamma zero. And you learn that this theory has a p dimensional defect, topological defect, because it was a TQFT, p dimensional topological defect. And I'm using the word defect to mean that it interacts with the theory, it's coupled to that. Uh, yeah, uh, given by this DP, right, DP. So a version of this construction is very familiar. So what, well, if when P is equal to D, this is just known as uh, adding a discrete theta angle that we discussed. So we had an SPT, which carried the same gamma zero symmetry. We stacked it and then gave the diagonal gamma zero that gave us a different theory from P mod gamma zero. But now this gives a, which one? Yes, yes, yes. But that gamma zero now is uh, coming from the bulk. So there are some, uh, there is these Wilson lines. Okay. Yeah, it, it comes from objects in the bulk ending on this now. Yeah. So if I repeat it once, the gamma zero is No, I'm giving the diagonal. Does that answer the question? Okay. There is some gamma zero on this, but that that comes from uh, bulk topological defects ending on this now. Yeah, we will see this explicitly happening. So, is it clear that this p-dimensional guy is now a topological defect? To yeah, because it was topological here. I could have before gauging, I could have put it over here or here. So it oh, you started with a topological. Yeah. Okay. If you start with a non-topological, you can do the same construction. You get some non-topological defects. Yeah. Okay. And now you can in fact get a full full d minus one category using this, which should be a subcategory of your symmetric category of the full theory. Uh, so, what is the construction? Right. So, uh, maybe let's uh, move over here. Yeah. So, I 
one thing you said this is a uh, this is just uh, recasting the uh, idea that you get Wilson lines and this I will I will come to that point first let me describe the full structure and then I'll use Wilson lines as an example so this red will appear somewhere yeah on the line from the you use the mic because uh, people in Zoom. Uh, uh, right now you are trying to give a example of higher representation of zero groups. Yes. Oh, that's why this example. Uh, it will arise out of this example. Yeah. Okay. Then you will talk about higher representation of higher groups. Yeah, I won't talk about the mathematically. I'll just claim that whatever structure we, we will get from this, which will be a very explicit structure, and I'll claim that's precisely the two representations, and you can go match in the literature that it is. So you can match with the math literature. That's the same. Okay. okay. Right. So we can modify this slightly, right? So if I take now, so first of all, I could have taken p to be d minus one, and obtain some co-dimension one defects in this. Way. So I have some dual d minus one defect. So let's take it to be uh, d minus one. So I can start building a D minus one category now of dual symmetries. This will be some subcategory of the full symmetries of the theory T mod gamma zero. Okay, uh, these are the objects. So these are D minus one dimensional TQF is with gamma zero non anomalous gamma zero symmetry, right? So objects. Dimensional TQF is with gamma zero symmetry, zero form symmetry. Actually, it's possible to consider anomalous symmetries if there is some kind of anomaly cancellation between the. the yeah, if you have anomaly, then the, this part will change because it comes attached to an SPT. So it will be a defect between the, the T mod gamma zero and T mod gamma zero plus a discrete theta. Right, but if you have a D minus one defect, for example, uh, then uh, that is a co-dimension one. Then uh, the diagonal gamma zero can still be non anomalous if there is an anomaly for each of the gamma zeros by anomaly. Zero. Then you can still gauge that diagonal gamma zero. Yeah, so if this gamma zero is anomalous and he, this gamma zero, is, sorry, that is non anomalous and this is anomalous, then you cannot, yeah. And then the diagonal is anomalous. Yeah, yeah that's fine. But if both of them are anomalous, Oh, then you need a yeah, but you cannot gauge in the bulk, right? So this needs to be non-anomalous. You so need to have one extra dimension if you want to. Yeah. yeah okay, so we are now constructing a D minus one category of dual symmetries that we obtain universally in any theory, in any non-topological theory, in any dimension, if we gauge a zero form symmetry. And the objects of this category in any such T mod gamma zero theory. I'll describe by D minus one dimensional TQFTs with gamma zero symmetry. They are in one to one correspondence with that. One morphisms. So to construct one morphisms, I just simply take our on this side with the decoupled system. Uh, I can take two D minus two of these TQFTs with gamma zero symmetry. And I look at interfaces between them, topological interfaces between these TQFTs. Uh, but not every topological interface will serve, will suffice. We need to demand that this is also gamma zero symmetry. So it needs to also carry gamma zero symmetry. So once we take such an interface, we can again put it over here, gauge the diagonal, and we obtain a topological codimension to defect between the two topological codimension one defects. So the one morphisms are D minus two dimensional interfaces between D minus one dimensional TQFTs, uh, but gamma zero symmetric. So gamma zero symmetric interfaces. Okay, you can ask the question. So this is a D minus one category. This is a D minus one category. This thing, the new thing. Yeah, I'm constructing a D minus yeah, one. D minus one. 
So I just want to understand, just to make sure I'm understanding that if, if D is equal to one, yeah. simplest possible case, and if D to start with is a topological theory, yeah. so it's a pretty boring example, but I just want to make sure. Yeah. So then uh, the T itself is specified by something like a single associative algebra, some homotopy. It's a representation of gamma zero. Huh? Let's say gamma zero is trivial for now. Even that's interesting, right? Yeah. Even if gamma zero is trivial, this construction is not trivial. Okay. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Well, you're not you're not gauging anything when you go back to the same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I'm still adding these. Uh, I'm constructing this new category, right? Yeah. So will this just be the category of a vector uh, a modules in that case? If a is giving, giving me the theory. Yeah. E, oh, and this is. But the, they won't be all local operators, right? I'm not constructing all the symmetries. I'm constructing a subcategory of the full D minus one category. So my, okay, let me pose it a question. So if T is a one-dimensional topological field theory. Yeah. Which is a boring object, I think. But then what is this? And gamma zero is trivial. Then what is the yeah. final answer? Then the there, is, there is nothing to insert. You don't get any. The dual symmetries are D not. minus one category. So it's a vector space. But it should D be is one. equal to one. D is you equal get to a zero category. Yeah. So a vector space or a chain complex, depending on. And that that is just complex numbers. So it's just the uh, identity. It's the boring one. Yeah. And what if gamma yeah. zero is non trivial? Yeah. If uh, gamma zero is non trivial, then. Okay, so what are you? You are adding some zero-dimensional things which are gamma zero invariant. Uh, okay, what are zero-dimensional? Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I want them to be invariant. So that's why I'm building the category. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, okay. So, zero form symmetry in zero dimensions does not actually exist. So, it's like a minus one. There is no zero form symmetry in zero dimensions. So, you should begin at d equal to two, I would say. And we will do these examples actually. We will do d equal to Yeah. Because I want to get to rep gamma zero, that basically includes d equal to. Okay. Right. So this, this is a d minus one category we are building just out of TQFTs, right? And this is a universal category, symmetry category, some sub symmetry category in any theory that can be obtained by gauging a zero form symmetry. Okay. These are one morphisms, and then you can continue. So higher morphisms would be some high dimensional sub interfaces of TQFTs. Which are gamma zero symmetric, right? Okay, so that, that's uh, the formal structure. Let's uh, let's do some examples for this. So suppose D was equal to two, or say in the D minus one category, I'm just looking at lines and lower dimensional things. I ignore all the other things. Then I'm looking for one D TQFTs with uh, gamma zero symmetry. Okay, these are very straightforward to describe. A one D TQFT is just a vector space. So I have a vector space to begin with. And now I want to make it gamma zero symmetric. So I want some action of gamma zero on this. So that just means that B should be a representation of gamma. So it should be in the should be a representation of gamma zero. So formally you can already see uh, all of these will become topological lines in this theory. Uh, T mod gamma zero theory in any dimension D, right? So these are the Wilson lines that we were talking about earlier. So any element of rep gamma zero gives rise to uh, a topological line in the. Just one basic question. I mean, uh, why is a one D TQFT a vector space? It's, it's because it's just the Hilbert space of that quantum yeah. mechanics. That's all. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> So we have recovered the Wilson lines out of this approach. Uh, now let's uh, do one high dimensional thing. Let's look at two D TQFTs with gamma zero symmetry. They are also quite trivial. So now we look at two D TQFTs. The gamma zero symmetry.
Okay. So first of all, we need to look at what is the two D TQFT, and then we will make it gamma zero symmetric. So two D TQFTs are uh, classified in terms of this Frobenius algebra, uh, and we want unitary things because we are dealing with unitary theories. We want unitary two D TQFTs. I think you have extended TQFT or what? When you say classified by Frobenius algebra, you talking about just ordinary, not with all this higher categorical structure. Right. Yeah. If you include all this data, then it's classified by the analog of, I mean, Frobenius category, Colabio category, to be precise. Okay. Uh, I am not sh sure what the Colabio category. Okay. What is the Frobenius algebra? It's what you associate to the circle, the partition function. Right. Uh, yeah. I, the vector space for that is indeed the Hilbert space on S one. On S one. Yeah. Uh, and all the other structures are just various transition amplitudes, etc. But that wouldn't recover all the ex data that you. Right. Uh, I, I think we can. So uh, let me describe what the structure I have in mind. Okay. Right. Because uh, physically, there's not much going on. There's a very, it's a very trivial system physically. I will describe how to connect to the Frobenius algebra theories, at least those things, and there will be some, right. So what is it essentially, right? In a 2D TQFT, we are asking for some, some vacua with some lines, right, and some uh, operators, right? And those, they were, I think, essentially trivial. So let, let, let me describe, okay. So you can you can now go ahead and uh, look at this the full classification this classification in terms of Frobenius algebras, and there is a partition function which uh, comes out on a genus G manifold. So it takes the form something like lambda G. So it's described in terms of some uh, numbers lambda i, some complex numbers lambda i. You raise them to this power, and you essentially I think sum over i. And I is sum from one to n. So the essential information about these theories is captured in terms of this number n, and in terms of these num complex numbers lambda. I. Okay, but these lambda i numbers are actually can actually be dropped. They are very trivial to incorporate because these are just Euler number counter terms. So physically, we would just say these are counter terms. We can ignore them. Or uh, more precisely, there are some invertible TQFTs in two dimensions. Uh, so such a theory can be described as follows. You have this n is the number of vacua of this theory. So you have some vacua labeled by one, two up to n. And in each vacuum, you have an invertible TQFT living over there, which is described by some, which is which is, takes values in complex numbers, and you have different of these. Invertible TQFTs. Okay. Uh, now, once we want group like symmetries between them, you can argue that all of these numbers have to be the same if you want to have a gamma zero symmetry. So there will just be a lambda on each of them. And then this lambda is just an invertible TQFT. So, so you can ignore it. You can take it out because you can always insert it at the end of the calculations. So I can reduce my whole thing to just n vacua and then I know what the theory has to be completely trivial because I know the full spectrum of defects now. So between n e to vacua i and j, I'm going to have some interface between them. Uh, let's call it some l i j, some line between them such that they compose nicely. So if you have l j k, this becomes I like it. The category of you're describing category. Hmm? One category you're describing. Yeah, it's going to be multi-fusion one category. These lines are going to describe multi-fusion one category, hmm. uh, which is just the category of n by n uh, matrices based based on vector spaces. Uh, I'm very confused by the statement that two D TQFTs are classified by it's in commutative for Venus algebras. Mm -hmm. That's it's not, it's not true. No, I it's true. It's true. But if you only study like 
uh, ordinary TQFTs, like not the kind that you're talking about where you study defects and co-dimensional defects and so on. Right. So then it's classified by, I mean, this, in the physics literature, I think it was Moore Siegel, something. I don't know. Uh, this match is Moore Siegel. Sorry? Yeah, this match is Moore Siegel completely. So yeah, but this is only the closed, whatever. I guess you'd call it the, the The open things, yeah. The, the, the open, you can also describe the open things by this approach. Yeah, and then you would get not just a commutative for Benis algebra, but like a. Right. It's, a, it's an extension. So when I'm not describing the full information, right? So I, I began with saying that you ignore some information about all these things, you reduce to these lambda i and n, and these lambda i and n are just, just physical information about the full theory. You're, of course, you can ask what are the boundary conditions now? And these boundary conditions are. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, so there is, there is one boundary condition for each vacuum and you can reduce to that case. So I'm building the physical, using some physical arguments, some physical systems to build such 2D TQFTs and ignoring some pieces like these uh, Euler counterterms. If I take uh, topological A model or topological B model, Mm -hmm. of some target Calabi or threefold, would that be an example of one of your 2D TQFTs? Mm -hmm. And if gamma zero is a group acting on the manifold, would it give rise to it's not, Is it going to be unitary? You want unitary theory? Yeah. So I'm using this fact that this, if you impose unitarity on Frobenius algebras, they become essentially uh, trivial. They become just a direct sum. So the only information that survives is N along with some lambda is. Right. If you take a twisted two-dimensional CFT, then you will probably have a structure. When you, the A model and B model that you said, they are, arise from a yeah. twisting of an underlying two-dimensional CFT. Yeah. I think in those cases, you will probably have, because then these are just some like this Valinde algebra. Uh, they're not going to be unitary, right? So I don't know what you mean by unitary in this case. Because, I mean, there will be just some set of ground states. And uh, I think there is the, the norm on those ground states won't be positive definite. Why? I, I thought it's just a chiral ring or something like that. I mean, at least in the A more, I mean, uh, yeah. Why won't it be positive? Uh, in the A model, it's just the uh, cohomology. The, um, you can define a norm. On, uh, so, uh, so those cases should no, it, yeah, it, be, uh, yeah. So usually, when you twist theories, you get non-unitary theories. So that's my typical expectation. I, maybe there is a formal argument, but I, I don't know at the moment. But a twisted two D CFT, you just restrict to the chiral ring. And yeah. There it is just. Uh, subset right of the states of the original cft so you're not uh, and if you compute the central charge is it uh, the negative no yeah you can consider i mean if you can if you consider unitary cfts to begin with okay. you start with a unitary cft and then you twist it okay i don't see why the that should be then it would be then become it would become by basis transformation one of these yeah, it's some so not what I thought, uh, that these will be just some uh, because this n will be just the dimension of the chiral ring, and uh, these will be this sort of Valinde. I mean, you you're basically diagonalizing the CIJK, mm -hmm. the structure constants, yes. those matrices, yes. uh, right? And the, yeah. these will be the eigenvalues of that matrix. Right. Uh, something like saying this quantum cohomology is semi-simple or something that you can. Uh, is semi simple like that you can write it as is, is that what uh, this country is that you can write? Yeah, 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 in terms of matrix. Yes, yeah, semi simplicity is what, uh, it, is what it's, uh, it's a result of unitarity. Okay, uh, so but then if these are examples, then it's still not true that the closed, uh, I mean, that the that knowing just this tells you everything about the TQFT. 
you don't know about the open open strings. Uh, yeah. Uh, or maybe you do. I don't know. But I don't see how to. Uh, sorry, I, I yeah. The, I'm saying that you can essentially reduce it to have, for each vacuum you will have one boundary. So you will you will have extra lines. Okay. The boundary condition would be just this, some LIs, and then you can act on them by some LJI to get these kind of fusions. It's going to be very trivial. Yeah. So this is after I've set all the lambda is to one. When you have non-trivial lambda is, then there, there, is some, there is some extra information that you can have. I haven't solved those equations, but it's not so simple. In those cases, yeah. Okay. Uh, so right. So physically, these two DTQFTs that we are going to be looking at because we want a gamma zero symmetry, and we can remove this. This this all these lambda has become a single Euler counterterm, and then we can remove this. In the end, we can always add it later. Uh, and these are pretty trivial. So all the physical information is how many vector do you have? And then you can transition between them uh, and you can end each vacuum. Okay. Now let's try to make it gamma zero symmetric. Right. So this was the structure of the theory. And now we want to make it uh, symmetric under gamma zero. Okay. Again, let's, upload, uh, let's follow our physical approach. So we saw that this is just n backward, right? Uh, and now trying to make this gamma zero symmetric, you have some possibilities, right? And let's look at some irreducible example. We, because we can construct reducible examples by taking direct sums. Let's take some uh, action of gamma zero on this theory, which, which, which is irreducible, okay? So what we can do is the one of the following things. So say I have this gamma zero symmetry and I take a subgroup of this. Uh, okay. It would mean that it, some other action does, the action acts on this fully. Uh, yeah. yeah, it would become clear once I describe it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So what you can have is you can have spontaneous symmetry breaking of this gamma zero. So what this means is that in each vacuum, in a in a vacuum I say, you have some subgroup of the full group, which is spontaneously preserved. But then these walls implement the, the other elements in the, when you take the cosets of uh, gamma zero prime cosets inside gamma zero, uh, those elements implement these walls and they change the backward. So in a sense, uh, gamma zero mod gamma zero prime symmetry spontaneously broken. And this gamma zero prime is spontaneously preserved. So here I'm going to be a little bit uh, not imprecise because uh, gamma zero can be non-abelian and I'm assuming the things are abelian. Uh, so what happens is that if you have gamma zero prime, uh, which is preserved, then there is some subgroup uh, which is preserved over here, which is isomorphic to this, uh, but can be obtained by acting by one of these coset elements, right? So the idea is that you have some of these cosets and the number of these cosets are the number of backward. So n is the, this, the order of this. And in each vacuum, you have a particular subgroup which is preserved, spontaneously preserved. Uh, okay, but this is not the full thing that we can describe. We know that physically, even when you have spontaneously preserved uh, things, then you can have, still have SPT phases in that vacuum that can arise. So what are SPT phases? Uh, 
So there are trivial phases. So we can just restrict to one of these vacuum to understand it. So say we have some vacuum in which some some, some group gamma zero prime of zero form symmetry is present. So we are looking looking for a theory which has a single vacuum. So it's almost a trivial theory. Uh, uh, it, right it was a trivial vacuum uh, but now when you care about the symmetry it might have some non trivial information in it okay so right. so what does that mean uh, so it means that if you you have this theory with a single vacuum you compute its partition function on any manifold on any two dimensional manifold you just get one it's a trivial theory but once you turn on a background for this zero form symmetry, so let me say I picked the background A1, then you don't get one, but you get some, some number, some invertible number. This is not equal to one, but it's in, yeah, it's in U1. So it's a, it's a background for gamma zero prime. No, it's an element of uh, H1 of gamma zero prime. Uh, so, no, H1 of the manifold. Of this group. Okay. And so the SPT phases are actually classified by the cohomology group H2 of this group, gamma zero prime with values in u1 uh, and this this now this class actually describes the partition function the way it describes is that follows you can realize this a1 as a map from uh, sigma g to the classifying space for this group and then given one of these classes, this is uh, I'm writing group cohomology, so it's actually a cohomology class on the classifying space. So once I pick one of these classes, say let me call it alpha, alpha inside this, I can pull back this. So I can look at A1 star of alpha. Now this is valued uh, in so yeah, with coefficients in U1. It just gets pulled back to the manifold, and now you can integrate it on the manifold. So when you integrate it on sigma g, you obtain this partition function. So this is the classification of SPT phases. Uh, yeah, it's valid in U1. It's already valid in U1. Okay. Uh, I may be missing. No, this is not a, this is two dimensional a, diagram. In theory. This is just a, you target BG with G is a discrete group. Yeah, but the yeah. group is not gauged. Sorry, then I don't understand. The gamma zero group is just a zero form symmetry group. So, diagram pattern theory would be once you gauge the zero form symmetry. So, what are you doing again? So, the, how is the form? This so, you have a theory with a zero form symmetry. Yeah. You pick a background for it. The background is a map into the classifying space. You pick a class in H2 in the classifying space. You pull it back and you integrate it on your uh, space time. That, in, that, that U1 number is the partition function of this theory in the presence of the background that you have chosen. Uh, you want to go to diagram bit and you just gauge this zero form symmetry. Then it's the diagram bit based on this. Yeah, it's just the action, and then once you sum over it, it becomes diagram. Right, right. Partition function is this U1 number, yeah. Yeah. These are all U1 quantities instead of R mod Z quantities that we usually work with, then you need an exponential. Right. Uh, action is an R mod Z. Sorry, is this an invertible theory? Yeah, this is an invertible theory. This is like some anomaly for something. Yeah, it's an SPT phase. 
it's an anomaly for one dimensional theories okay uh, so you can have the respective phases uh, right so if we return back over here here you, you, you had spontaneous symmetry breaking but in each of them you can have an spt phase there's an extra structure you can choose so let me pick some alpha over here for gamma zero prime and spt phase then the spt phase for this other group which is isomorphic to it is simply obtained by acting by one of these coset elements on alpha so this is uniquely fixed this alpha j is fixed as well and same for all vector right so this is my now i have obtained a classification of gamma zero symmetric 2d tqfts up to one euler number counter term an overall euler number counter term okay uh, so what is the classification uh, and this is essentially you cannot have more because it's, uh, it's known that you the all the phases that you can obtain in two dimensions are uh, just spontaneous symmetry breaking and spt phases so the what is the classification you choose a subgroup gamma zero prime inside your gamma zero and you choose an alpha in h2 gamma zero prime and these would be the irreducible 2d tqfts with gamma zero symmetry h2 no it's finite group is yeah that is with z coefficients and u1 coefficient that's a different thing yeah we have mean a group homology yeah. yeah yeah this is a group homology of gamma zero is the same as the ordinary homology okay Right. So this is the classification of all the irreducible TQFTs, uh, and then uh, yeah. So this is this is going to give me the simple objects in this two category that I'm trying to construct because these are irreducible; they're simple. Okay. Uh, Does it need to be irreducible? Yeah, because all the vacuo are related by the action of uh, some group element. So you can go from one vacuum to another by some group element. Is it, that's what you mean by irreducible for but you have more general things by taking direct sums of these irreducible ones so there you have some collection of vacuo on which gamma, some gamma zero elements are acting and another orbit so different orbits vacuo fall into multiple orbits um irreducibility means that vacuo fall into a single orbit yeah i'll bug you about this later right so let's compute this explicitly for some example of gamma zero right so let's do the simplest case we take gamma zero to be z2 uh, then what are the options i have i can choose either the trivial group or the full group and for both of these this uh, group homology vanishes so all i i just have two options so let me denote the one in which i have chosen the full group to be spontaneously preserved that's the, that's the identity because you have a single vector right so you have z2 spontaneously preserved and there is no spt phase for it possible so let me denote it like this and then the other one let the one in which i have chosen this the trivial group so all of z2 spontaneously broken is uh, is this d2 z2 and this can also be recognized as z2 gauge theory a 2d z2 gauge theory up to all the number counter terms so that's essentially it all z2 symmetric 2d tqft is up to all the number ambiguities are just given by a z2 gauge theory uh, and the trivial theory okay uh, yeah it's a, it's a broken one Like why is it easy? Sorry, it's spontaneous. Yeah, so Z2 gauge theory is true. You start with a trivial theory, you gauge uh, zero form symmetry. So get a minus one for dual one, minus one form symmetry, which are these two back one. No sir. 
where two d right so you get uh, again sorry a zero from symmetry and uh, yeah so so the action is basically this a1 delta b0 and b0 as a set two vector so you can ask so, uh, this is a very basic question so uh, I, i know the vacuum is in general but in this context what does it translate to mathematically you know, what is a vacuum in terms of representations and stuff like that a vacuum is a, it was this uh, different eyes that we had over there different eyes are what irreducible representations of the fubinus algebra of what the different eyes or what uh, labeling what the eyes are numbers they are one one yeah. but so uh, these are special states in your uh, frobenius algebra special elements elements in the frobenius yeah. algebra okay there's a particular basis in your yeah, are the projectors because your yeah. frobenius algebra yeah no sorry yeah these are projectors these are uh, projectors yeah. okay yeah. so they're like there's a particular set of projectors right the label are irreducible representations of a are they irreps of a let's say a is the frobenius algebra mm -hmm. are there irreducible representations of a i mean modules over a are those the same as maybe i don't know calling vector maybe is this a is a is a canonical basis inside this frobenius yeah. algebra yeah yeah which satisfies each basic element satisfies p square equal to p it satisfies p square equal to p yeah. project these are projectors yeah those are what you calling back your yeah so after state operator correspondence they translate to this back yeah okay uh right so this was for z to get sir so now you know that in any symmetry in any theory where you gauge uh, z to uh, z to zero form symmetry you always obtain at least these surfaces and these are beyond the wilson lines so you obtain this wilson lines plus also these surfaces you can figure out more informations like for example what are the morphisms from uh, this object to this object so these would be some uh, right so yeah, so these these things can also be figured out basically you are looking for okay so ends of preserved things uh, right okay i don't recall at the moment but this can also be figured out so in terms of some quantum mechanical systems which have anomalies right in in case when you have spt phases in some vacuum and you want to end that vacuum you need to insert a quantum mechanical system with an anomaly over there uh yeah and then uh, when you have spontaneous symmetry breaking you want to pick a quantum mechanical system for each vacuum and they are related by the action of the g symmetry you can go between two different of these irreducible theories as well by choosing quantum mechanical system having the difference of the two spt phases okay uh, right so these are actually known uh, recently they were also discussed from other points of view this kind, this kind of defect is known as a condensation defect so re recall that we had uh, when i gauge z to zero form symmetry i obtain a z2 d minus 2 form symmetry uh, and these were the wilson lines now i can gauge these wilson lines along a surface should all the story is before you gauge gamma zero right you're just looking at different uh, co dimension higher co dimension defects yeah. tqfts on some tqfts yes. that's all you have done yeah. so far but they become defects after gauging after gauging so that's what you're describing yeah thanks so i'm saying that the defect after gauging can be recognized as a condensation defect so there is there are these wilson lines that you get and these wilson lines are give, describing a d minus 2 form symmetry so you can gauge them in whole of space time or along some sub manifold in space time so if you gauge them along a surface in space time uh, you obtain uh, what is known as a condensation defect and this can be recognized as a condensation defect for that which is essentially the statement that says e to gauge set okay uh, and if you compute this full category now in this way you indeed find that it coincides with two rep zero uh, and in this way if you compute it, it coincides with two rep gamma zero
Yeah. Yeah, this is some symmetry category in the uh, in the theory after guessing. Yeah. Two rep gamma gamma zero is an ordinary group. Yeah. So two rep gamma zero means group actions on categories. Yeah, it's it's a two category. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there are two representations. They are uh, actions. Like so. I mean, I guess you want the module categories for rep gamma zero. Module categories for rep gamma zero. Yeah. So and they form this two category. Okay. Right. So you, it coincides with this. And in fact, there is a general result one can prove that all the of surfaces that you're getting over here are actually for, for come for free because they're all condensation defects. So you can take rep gamma zero lines and you can perform a generalized gauging on a surface. And all the, using these generalized gaugings, you can generate all of these objects. So going from rep to two rep, you don't really, didn't really produce anything new in this. But now I want to go to a case where you do produce something new, which are not condensation defects. Sorry, one question. So two rep gamma zero is the same as two D TQFTs with gamma zero action. Yeah, yeah, that turned out to be a non-trivial statement. Oh, that, that would follow a curve. Uh, right? no, we, we begin with two D TQFTs with gamma zero symmetry. We perform this analysis. We obtain this classification. We, we deduce the full categorical structure, yeah. and we find that it coincides with two rep gamma zero. What coincides with two rep gamma zero? This this two category that we construct. The two category of two D TQFTs. Is... Yeah. Oh, but that's okay. That's that's a non-trivial result. That, that's a physical it seems, it seems meaning, that gives a physical meaning to this two category. Okay, maybe, maybe this is kind of a different proof or something, but like a 2D T50 is classified by a category. Yeah. And giving a gamma zero action on it by your definition of like topological operators, will almost by definition, I think if you expand what the definition of a 2D. Don't think so, because once you go to three category case and you look at three D TQFTs, they're not given by three rep gamma zero. By three rep gamma zero. Uh, so you you have a topological order starting from three dimensions, okay. which is not characterizing either spontaneous symmetry breaking or SPT physics. So let me describe what n rep in general is. So n rep has spontaneous symmetry breaking and SPT in it, and these SPT are now H n elements rather than H two elements, right? I, I don't want to slow you down, but I think the math people may not know what those words mean. Some of us. Yeah, I'm giving a physics argument for why. So what is the dictionary like? What is it? What does SPT mean in like this language? And what does SSP mean? So it's the same thing. You have uh, some backbone. So you have an almost trivial theory with some backbone, which are related by some walls. Uh, all of these form a single orbit under. So that's spontaneous symmetry breaking. And the SPT means in each vacuum for the preserved subgroup, you choose an HN element. But starting from three dimensions and higher, there's also an option of topological order that you can have. So you can have a single vacuum, but it's not an SPT phase, but it's still gamma zero symmetric. So it's a modular tensor category, but with a gamma zero action on it, which has a gamma zero automorphism, the modular tensor category. And those things I think are not in three rep, are not in three rep. Yeah, three rep would be spawned with that three elements. Okay, uh, right. So, for two, so all the two rep of a group turned out to be quite trivial physically because they were just condensation defects. They could be could have been obtained once you knew the Wilson lines. Now uh, we want to go to another case, which does. The alpha is the such an element. Uh, it's it's H n of gamma zero prime. You still have a gamma zero prime, and yeah, H n of gamma zero prime with values in U. U one, okay. Uh huh. So this would be this would give you some partition functions of an n-dimensional invertible theory. 
Okay, and then you know the spontaneous symmetry breaking will be again it. it, it uh, yeah, how do you think about that? So it's just different vacuum which form an orbit under it. Yeah, it just changes vacuum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the background in this thing that you use to calculate these partition functions will be some Hn minus one. The thing uh, that we yeah, this H1. Yeah, the backgrounds are still A1 and it's a map to this, but now the cohomology group is now Hn. Class is an Hn, which you pull back to an Hn class on the manifold, which is n dimensional. So you can integrate on the full manifold. So, so you were saying that before that A1, you chose it from H1, right? Yes. So now you choose it from Hn minus one. No, it's still H1. It's still an A1 because. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. So, 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 so the sigma is now a n manifold now. Yeah. But, uh, but you're still looking at. Yeah. Uh, only H1s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, and already here, I think there will be more. So this this is because you are looking at zero form symmetries. Yes. You know, like you you know, if you if you have like higher form symmetries, then you will then you will change the H one to something else. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So already here, uh, physics dictates that there should be more things. Even if you don't go to topological order, because there these what we are looking at are bosonic SPT phases. And bosonic SPT, yeah, uh, I don't think bosonic SPT phases in general dimensional classified by group homology. A group homology is some subset. So there are much more things. Yeah. So what do you mean by topological order? I don't understand. Uh, yeah. SPT plus this HN elements, is that what you mean? or? Topological order means that uh, you have a different Hilbert space. Hilbert space have different dimension on different manifolds. So on sphere, you have one dimension because you have a single vacuum. But then when you go on a torus, you might have like four vacuum or something. But uh, what is the classification of that? Is it the same as this SPT classification? No. No, it's a different, yeah, it's a different classification problem. Mm -hmm. It's a classification of modular tensor categories in some sense. Modular tensor categories have a single vacuum, but they can have different dimensional Hilbert spaces on a other manifolds, non trivial manifolds. Three dimensions, Chern Simons theories. Three dimensions, Chern Simons theories probably covered the classification, right? Yeah. Of SPT phases. Yeah. So in n equal to three, again, SPT is sufficient. I mean, this H3 is. Uh, uh, it's Chern Simons theories, but I give this topological order. Right. But that's the, 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 the that's all the topological order you can get in n equal to three, is it? No, I, uh, no. I, no, there, uh, people would like to believe some people, but uh, it's not known mathematically whether that's true. Yeah. Probably, I don't know. I see. That was for invertible theories, probably. These are non invertible TQFTs in general. Yeah, and those are not all HN, right? They're not all group homology type. Group homology is a subgroup of that. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to move on to a case where we get some non condensation things, some genuinely new things. And this will connect to our pin plus example. So this is the case of looking at two reps, not of a group, but of a two group. So what's a two group, first of all? Sure, sorry, just when you say condensation defect, you mean a general TQFT or an SPT phase? Condensation defect is that you, you can produce it as a gauging of some lower dimensional defects. Defects with the general TQFT and not necessarily of the SPT type, right? No, this is happening in a theory. Uh, in any non-topological theory, mm -hmm. you have some topological defects, let's say lines, and you have another one which is surface, but the surface can be obtained just as a network of lines. So it means it's a gauging of lines on the surface. Okay. So that's what condensation means, sir. But in your description of defects, yeah. 
as t uh, as t q f is it means non gauge theories so here we saw that it was a gauge theory right this one this non trivial guy was a gauge theory and now we are looking for things which are not gauge theories so you're saying you start with t q f t in the ungauged theory yeah and then when you gauge it you may get condensation defects but you may get something else so that, uh, yeah uh, so it's not that every t q f t gives us always to a condensation defect right okay. if you gauge a zero form symmetry and you only care about surfaces okay the surface of our condensation ah. for a finite zero form symmetry yeah but in other like lines are not but the three and three surfaces are not yeah. okay right so we want to look at two wrap of a two group so what's a two group first of all it has two it has a zero form symmetry and one form symmetry as components which are not decoupled they talk to each other sort of so here i will only look at special examples of two group which are known as split two groups so what this would mean is that you have some zero form symmetry group gamma 0 some one form symmetry group gamma 1 and the only interaction between them is via an action of gamma 0 and gamma 1 uh recall that this was precisely happening in spin 4m we had a z2 times z2 and a z2 and the z2 was acting by exchanging the two zeros so there was a split two group symmetry there and now we want to ask what happens if i gauge this two group symmetry what dual symmetries do i get so we want to classify 2d tqf is with the split two group symmetries okay Uh, strictly speaking, I guess you haven't said what it means to have a two-group acting on a theory, right? I mean, I think one can imagine the definition, but am I right to say that you haven't explained? I mean, for groups, you yes. Right. So now you have uh, topological codimension one defects, codimension two defects, such that you have the following property. Um, that if you pass one of these so let's say a gamma 1 inside gamma 1 a gamma 0 in gamma 0 then on the other side when you pass it through you obtain gamma 0 dot gamma 1 so you are looking for in in your 2d tqf is you are looking for a collection of lines and these will be points such that if you take point across a line it it's changed so that's what we want to do we want to classify all such possible labeling set we can have okay so so we are looking for a two group symmetric tqft in particular it's zero form symmetric so we can start with our zero form symmetric classification so say i have chosen gamma 0 prime for in some vacuum i have vacuum and then i have some number of vacuum and there there is some alpha that i have chosen for this okay uh now what is a one form symmetry now one one we now need to make it one form symmetry so i need to choose some operators here but these operators are some numbers there's only a complex worth complex numbers worth of choices of these operators so i'm choosing just some character so some element in some character for gamma 1 so some q in uh, the contre argument dual group of that and then i can choose some so i choose some qi here some qj here and the what i want is that qi and qj should be related by the action of uh, of this uh, of the coset element in gamma in gamma 0 that i have and moreover qi should be left invariant by this sub because that is spontaneously preserved and that's it that would uh, all possible choices of such characters would just like give me all the irreducible two group symmetric theories so let's perform it in our example is the split two group that we know sorry you repeat two dimensional theories hmm two dimensional theories what kind of theories are you looking at yeah two d theories yeah two d theories and two uh... d tqft is with the two group symmetry okay and irreducible still means the same thing sir irreducible still what is irreducible mean no again the number of uh, uh, so there are two requirements now one of them is that Uh, the number of orbits of vacua is just one and then in each phase you are choosing only a character an irreducible representation of gamma 
rather than a reducible one. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to understand that better, but maybe it'll take a long, so yeah. I'll ask you later. Okay. So let's do it for this example. Gamma one is z two times z two, and gamma zero is z two, which acts on this. So we start with these guys. We know that this was just identity and the z two we said. And now we want to see when we give these characters for this, do they split into multiple things? Yeah. What are the possible ways of giving characters? So here we call that the whole Z two, uh, whole Z two subgroup is spontaneously preserved. So the characters that we choose must be symmetric under this action in one vacuum that we have. So we can choose plus plus or minus minus. these are the only two options because i need a z2 symmetric choice so this plus plus is again the is the new identity that you have so let's label this now as the new d2 identity and this one uh, it's it's just an spt for one form symmetry it's only a one form some non trivial one form symmetry part so it's an spt phase for one form symmetry let me call it d2 v because this will become the d2 v that we saw in the pin plus example Okay, now this one has two vector. Let me call them zero and one. Uh, and now we want to choose. This is the Z two wall, so we want to choose characters such that they are symmetric when you cross the wall. So one choice is you choose plus plus and plus plus. Let's just call this one as D two Z two because there is no information about characters here. Okay, then we can choose minus 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 minus. This just looks like I have dressed it by D two V, so let me call this as D two V Z two. And then the most interesting one, I choose plus minus. Then I am forced to choose minus plus over here. So this one, let me call it D two S C. And then you have minus plus with plus minus, but that's isomorphic to this. So this is the set of simple objects in my two category. This and this. So notice that it's quite similar to the pin plus, except we have two new entries that we didn't know about earlier. And now we want to figure out the fusion rules, etc., and justify why pin plus should have this category. Okay, so it's easy to justify why pin plus should have this two category. So what you do is you. Let's say you you were in spin theory, right? Spin four m. Uh, it has this gamma one equals to z two times z two, and a zero form symmetry. And we wanted to gauge gamma zero, but let's not do that. Let's instead gauge this gamma one. This is four d. So then we go to four d p s of four m theory. And we obtain a dual z two times z two one form symmetry. So one form symmetry dualizes to one form in four dimensions. So I again have the same gamma one and the same gamma zero even in the PSO theory. And the action of gamma zero and gamma one is just the dual action, and the dual action is exactly the same as well. It exchanges the two z twos. Okay. Now I actually wanted to go to four d pin plus by gauging gamma zero. So this is gamma one gauging. Gamma zero gauging. So this gamma zero gauging can be obtained by inverting this gamma one gauging and doing the gamma zero gauging. But the inverting of gamma zero gauging is gauging the gamma one of this because uh, this the uh, logic of dual symmetries. If you gauge and then you gauge again, you come back to the same theory. So from the point of view of this, you are gauging gamma one and gamma zero both to go here. So that means you're gauging the full two group. And so the symmetry that you obtain should be this uh, symmetry category that we described. Okay, so this tells us that 4D pin plus should have this sort of category, uh, right? And now let's compute the fusion rules. There is no direct way to see that these new things should exist just from the gamma zero gauging. No direct way. Uh, the other, uh, the two non-trivial defects that you have there. 
when you motivate no, them? Yeah, they, they can be understood because this is, uh, okay. Anyway, you should probably finish and then we can talk later. Sorry. Well, yeah. Uh, so you have gauge gamma zero, you obtain a new gamma one, uh, gamma two. That's lines. And uh, that's a Z2 that can be used to create this condensation defect. And then you can get this one by fusing this two. Okay. And these. Yes, but not the fusion. The fusion rules will be interesting now. Yeah. Okay. So before going there, I have to first do an exercise about uh, D to Z two first. Uh, when you did not have a two group, then you just had zero form. So we we wanted to compute this. Right. And this was just some two vacuous connected by a wall. So in the stack theory, the vacuous that you will have will be just collections of these. There will be four vacuous like this. And now you're going to take the diagonal Z2 action. So diagonal Z2 action connects this to this and this to this. So it just decomposes into two copies of D2. D2. So this was the fusion rule in the before and accounting for one form symmetry. Now let's account for one form symmetry, uh, right? And this, so this will remain true for this guy, uh, but now let's do it for this one. This is the non-trivial one. Uh, so here, what are we doing? So we have, we are now trying to do, uh, right. So we have plus minus minus plus plus minus minus plus. So now you can see in zero zero vacuum, you have a plus plus because you're taking products of characters when you stack. And then it was related to one one vacuum that also has plus plus. So this this particular one of these pieces inside it is that is this D two Z two. But the other piece in the zero one and one zero. So if you take zero with one, you obtain minus minus and the same with this. So the second piece is now D two V Z two. And notice that this is nowhere close to the naive answer, which was this. Right? So this is not correct at all. You instead obtain some condensation defect and a condensation on top of your D2V defect. So this is the correct fusion rule. And there are other ways to argue for this. This is not the only way. Right. Uh, okay, so are there any questions about this? Right. So this was the main main lesson here. So we, we looked at some two categories, which describe some non invertible symmetries because the fusions are not invertible, for example, because of this factor of two. Right. Uh, and these describe some symmetries, uh, non invertible symmetries of gauge theories, some very ordinary gauge theories, like 4D pin plus theory. Uh, you could also consider so if you don't like disconnected groups, even in non disconnected groups such no sorry in disconnected groups only. Uh, right, you can uh, now in general start gauging so you, you can take some group symmetries right like some gauge theory with some gauge group some QR gauge theory, it will have some one form symmetry coming from its. Uh, from the centers which do not act on the matter content. And then there can be various outer automorphisms that can give you a very complicated gamma zero. So we saw an example of S3 already, but you can get other things like a, a dihedral group. So if you take a spin 4n, spin 4n theory with a bi-vector scalar matter, 
then you have a, an outer automorphism z2 from here an outer automorphism z2 from here and an outer automorphism z2 from here but these do not commute and these three z2s actually form the dihedral group of order eight. so you can get very complicated examples of gamma one and gamma zero so and complicated actions of gamma zero and gamma one because these outer automorphisms act on the center so you can get all many different kinds of split two groups like this and then you can gauge by this two group and consider that gauge theory is going to have this complicated two categorical symmetry non invertible symmetry we saw one of the examples in four dimensions uh, we can give a general d dimension example as well so in d dimension if you look at po4 and gauge theory pure that has precisely uh, this symmetry that we discussed because you can obtain this by starting from spin which has this two group structure and gauging the two group from spin gets takes you to p uh right so uh, yeah uh, let me stop over here thank you any questions so uh, if i take the trivial theory in some dimension uh -huh. and i can think of even just uh, zero form symmetry i mean think of gamma zero acting on it yeah. and if i gauge it uh -huh. what do i get uh, you get uh, this gamma zero gauge theory get gamma zero gauge theory. yeah so digraph it and theory digraph it okay gamma good. zero perfect yeah and if it's a lie group or something then i would get some you will get a one of these lie group gauge series which is non topological i see okay and if i take a two group now yes yeah. or let's say even very concretely in two dimensions take the trivial theory take the take a two group yeah. arbitrary two group acting trivially on this trivial theory what's the corresponding uh, uh right portion theory i mean it's probably not described or but have you have you thought about i don't think it's got a name uh, it's like digraph written theory for this two group for a two group yeah but what is that i mean have you studied it or do you know what you get it might be better to do it in 3d because just uh, gauging one from symmetry is not in nice in two dimension uh -huh. because the dual symmetry is minus one form symmetry uh -huh. so you will have to take some combinations uh, later so uh, 3d is simpler right so in 3d you yeah, can let's do 3d yeah so you can gauge yeah you can have a two group gauge theory and this is what uh, i think it will be one of these model at answer category theories uh, yeah 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 which one which modular tensor category uh, i mean is there, is there like a description of the yeah, i think these are uh, these are drinfeld centers for tambar yamagami categories yeah okay so i have to ask you for that yeah uh, any other questions any questions from the uh, online audience Okay. Um, now let's thank Lakshya again for a 